Legal Notice, Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Waitley. Notice is hereby given that the Zoning Board of Appeals of Waitley will hold a public hearing on Thursday, November 17th, 2022 at 6.40 p.m. On October 11th, John Hanmer applied on behalf of DMCTC Incorporated for a special permit to become an indoor marijuana cultivator on premises located at Seven River Road and owned by Lawrence Benedict and Nicole Rawls. The special permit being sought would be in addition to the existing special permit for outdoor marijuana cultivator at the property. Application for the special permit is to be considered under the provisions of the Waitley Zoning Bylaws as provided by Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A. The hearing will take place virtually via Zoom the rules of decorum for a public hearing remain in effect and the chairperson will seek comments from the public when appropriate to do so. Uh, it then gives the computer link for to access this hearing along with the numbers to dial for joining by phone with the meeting passcode. And after that, this notice is published electronically on www.recorder.com slash public-notices and www.masspublicnotices.org. Signed Roger P. Lipton Chair, Zoning Board of Appeals. And this ran in the Greenfield Recorder on November 3rd and November 10th. Chris, any objections to the way that's phrased or written? No, that sounds fine to me. Okay, so uh, I'll let you begin with your presentation. It might help if you refreshed our memory. What permits has the um, uh, petitioner um, received so far in that location? Um, so we have a special permit for outdoor marijuana cultivator, which also required uh, site plan approval. Um, and then there was a, um, an order of conditions from the Conservation Commission uh, for the, the work as part of that site plan. How about in the interior? Uh, in terms of building permits? Um, no, zoning, zoning permits from us. Um, is it the, uh, I guess I don't quite understand the question. I'm not trying to trick you, but didn't we address um, the interior at some point? Oh, so um, on the original submission, we had highlighted two things. And I actually, I have this special permit, which is hopefully gonna jog my memory um, on the second one. Um, yeah, so there were, um, there were two additional, I guess, requests that I had included in that letter for that very first permit, uh, which included um, the fact that DMCTC intended to have the property manager uh, reside in the farmhouse on the property, and we wanted to ensure that that was not in conflict with the portion of the zoning bylaw that prohibits marijuana establishments from sharing, uh, uh, from, from existing in a residence. Um, and that farmhouse, of course, is outside of the secure perimeter uh, where the actual uh, marijuana handling and growing occurs. And then we also um, highlighted the fact that the, there's an existing barn on the property that is within a property line setback. Um, and I think that you know, however I phrased those requests at the time, uh, ZBA determined that there was no action for them to take um, as, as part of those proceedings. Um, and I think that's even addressed in our special permit. Um, so the special permit reads, we approved request number one for the cultivation facility as this is secluded farmland. We did not make a quote finding per request as that is not in our power. Uh, that would refer to, um, I think I was looking for a finding on the uh, continued non-conformance of the barn. Um, and then you also say that we did not clarify for request number three, who could live in the existing farmhouse. So uh, simply no decision was made as to those two points. And what was the date of that one? Um, this was issued on September 26, 2020.
And then subsequent to that, did we grant anything? Uh, not through ZBA. We did go back to the planning board for two minor um, revisions of the site plan approval. Uh, one of those was that the original site plan called for 12 individual freestanding greenhouses. Um, instead, uh, the current site plan shows two larger greenhouses of the same total footprint. Um, and then we also went back to the planning board uh, for approval of uh, a temporary site plan condition where one of those two large greenhouses would not be built immediately, but in their place, a couple of storage trailers would be placed. Um, and that was approved as a minor edit to the site plan uh, conditioned on that temporary condition lasting no more than 24 months. But what was the one when uh, the Hatfield Planning Board was in attendance? Oh, uh, that was for Three River Road. Okay. Um, which was the, uh, uh, so that's adjacent to this site, uh, the marijuana manufacturing, um, and a portion of that property sits in Hatfield. Um, and uh, so even though none of the active portions of the site are located in Hatfield, the driveway um, coming into the site does pass through the Hatfield portion. Um, and so we needed clarification from that board um, as to whether there was um, any uh, zoning or special permit issue. Um, okay, so I that's think, Three River Road. So what's the address? Yeah. For, what's the address? Sorry, for? say it again. That was Three River Road. What's tonight's? <laughs> Tonight is Seven River Road, which is the cultivation facility. And these are the same owners? Uh, the same applicants. The properties are owned by different people. Okay, got it. All right, so go ahead with your presentation. Thanks. Great. Do you want me to make you the co-host, Chris? Uh, that would be great. I do have uh, a couple of plans to bring up. Okay. Okay, you should be okay. Great. Um, so we'll start, I guess, uh, to start, uh, I'm Chris Chamberlain, uh, civil engineer with Berkshire Design Group. Um, uh, John Hanmer, who's the uh, operations manager for DMCTC, is supposed to be on the line. I don't see his name. I'm not sure if he's listed as somebody uh, else on here, but um, he presumably will be along at some point. Okay. Um, and uh, so the, let me see here. Um, so uh, this location is in the southeast corner of Waitley um, on this property here, which is a flag lot with frontage on River Road, um, again, just uh, north of the Waitley Hatfield town line. Um, and zooming in the uh, condition of the site before DMCTC got there uh, was this. Um, there is driveway access from River Road um, through the, the sort of flagpole of the flag lot, uh, an existing farmhouse, which was at the time used as a residence. Uh, this is the existing barn within the property line setback that I happened to manage, uh, mention before. Uh, and the remainder of the site was undeveloped um, agricultural fields. And so, here we see uh, the, the proposed site plan, uh, which is also identical to the approved site plan uh, for marijuana cultivation facility on this site. Um, back in 2020, as we were just discussing a little bit, uh, there was a special permit granted for outdoor cultivation on this site. At that time, the Waitley zoning bylaw did not define uh, what outdoor cultivation was as distinct from indoor cultivation. Um, and so we relied on the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission's regulations, which draw that distinction based on whether the uh, horticultural lighting is being used as part of the grow operation. Um, subsequently, uh, last year, the town amended that section of uh, the zoning bylaw to define indoor cultivation as any growing of marijuana inside a greenhouse or a building. Um, and so as a result, uh, what we have right now is a legally uh, existing non-conforming site because we are growing inside of these greenhouse structures, which is currently defined as indoor, despite the fact that we just have an outdoor cultivation special permit. Um, I mentioned that there were a couple of minor changes to the site plan, which are reflected on the plans that were submitted. 
Um, and again, just want to emphasize that the site plan as submitted is exactly the same as what was uh, approved for that outdoor license a couple of years ago. The only physical change that was proposed was to hang horticultural lighting in these two large greenhouses um, to allow for uh, better uh, control of product in the darker seasons of the month and to uh, extend the growing season a bit. After the site plan was submitted, uh, there were some neighbors that reached out to DMCTC to address um, a couple of uh, issues. Um, and those are a couple of things that uh, these were probably more planning board issues, but I do wanna uh, make sure they're out there. Um, the first was that uh, at this point, while uh, the fence has been built, uh, these three structures here have been built and one of the greenhouses have been built. Um, to date, landscaping hasn't yet been installed on this northern property line, which was proposed for screening. Um, and uh, what was unknown to me at the time when this uh, uh, plan was put in on behalf of DMCTC was they had been having conversations with the immediate abutter, uh, uh, Tim, I want to say his last name is Smith, I'm 95% sure that's accurate. Um, uh, with some concerns about the types of plantings that were proposed along this line being uh, taller than, than he might like to see and had some concerns about shading some of his agricultural field here. Um, and so there'd been conversations about changing some of these species to something different than what was allowed on the site plan. Uh, and so we, what we brought up with the planning board is that we'd like to create a little bit more flexibility to have shorter screening on that side, although there still is um, a commitment to plant a few different species, some deciduous, some evergreen, um, in order to break up this fence line. Um, also, uh, to date, the guard shack that was proposed outside the fence in roughly this location on the site plan has not been built. Uh, DMCTC security team uh, has a very good working relationship with the police department. Um, at this point, uh, the security plan is working well, um, and they're hoping to have the flexibility, again, it's probably a site plan issue, um, to either build or not build that guard shack at, uh, you know, at, on the advisement of the police department, but for now, uh, the intention is to not build that. Um, also, we got a comment from the highway department, um, even though this plan was approved through all the proper channels last time, uh, it does uh, turn out that the driveway as proposed does not comply with the Waitley uh, driveway uh, regulations. And I'm going to switch to just a zoomed in version of this plan. Uh, the intention of this plan was just to maintain the existing driveway curb cut in this location. But in fact, uh, the driveway regulations require a 20 foot offset from the property line. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, there's a requirement that the first 20 feet be paved when, as you can see on this site plan, uh, the, the plan stated to have gravel right up to the edge of pavement consistent with the existing condition. So those are all things we've already had our opening hearing with the planning board that we're going to be addressing on the plan to clarify and we're hopeful that those will get um, approved. Um, so then um, we have uh, submitted a narrative for the project that sort of steps through all of the zoning bylaw requirements uh, for marijuana establishments. Um, for the most part, our responses to those requirements were to say that, you know, the the way the site addresses them is identical to the way that the currently approved site has, um, just highlighting those couple of differences that come into play once we are under this indoor uh, grow facility with the horticultural lighting. Okay. Um, and so I'll just highlight a couple of them, one of which is sort of the, 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 the key fundamental difference um, in the bylaw changes. Um, you in a narrative form also that you can put on the screen? Um, I, oh, yes, I do. Uh, let's see. There is one in the permit application because I read that earlier. Yeah, uh, I think I, hmm, okay. Uh, I can get that. I'm just gonna have to pull my screen down for a moment while I grab it. Um, so I sh usually have that in this uh, folder for myself uh, before these start, but I overlooked that piece. I just have the plan right now. Um, Right. 
Actually, pulling it from your website may be the fastest way to go. So let me look there. I have it. If um, I believe I've got it right here. So I'll okay, just great. keep sharing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this is the whole application package. This was the, the uh, form application. Um, list of the butters. Uh, and then uh, this narrative was included in that package, which I assume all the board members uh, received. Uh, and I'll zoom in a little bit here. Um, so uh, a lot of background information, but as we go down to zoning compliance, which is where I was getting to. Um, so under the table of uses, uh, as was mentioned, we are applying uh, we're currently approved for outdoor marijuana cultivator on the site. The request is to maintain that approval and then also add the use indoor marijuana cultivator, which is allowed in the AR2 zone by special permit. Um, and as was the case with the original site plan, um, all of the sort of active um, uh, direct involvement with cannabis portions of the site are within the secured fenced area that's entirely within AR2. Uh, the farmhouse is being used for administrative purposes. Um, the non-conformance, we just noted, uh, as was the case before, uh, that we do have that barn um, that exists within the property setback, uh, which was an existing non-conformance, um, and the, there's no proposed change to that. Um, as far as general uh, zoning requirements, again, the, the, the site plan, the physical features, uh, exterior of the site are totally unchanged. The, the one change is the addition of horticultural lighting. Um, and so then, therefore, the requirements specific to marijuana uh, establishments, which includes um, additional setbacks from certain uses, such as uh, schools and parks and that sort of thing, um, is unchanged from the original uh, approval. We included the required plan uh, in uh, the site plan package, which I can pull up if anyone's interested, showing all those uses within a thousand feet of the site, which are um, primarily limited to residential and agricultural uses. Um, and then we went through the 21 uh, permitting standards in the zoning bylaw. Um, in terms of dimensional requirements, um, we meet all of the setbacks um, and the lot coverage. It's a very large site, so the lot coverage is, is quite small as a percentage basis. And again, there's no um, proposed changes to the exterior that would affect those requirements. Um, parking and loading, again, there's no change to the staffing. Um, the peak output of this site is exactly the same. The real purpose of this change is to add lighting to extend the season so that in those darker times of the month, the, the plants can be grown a little bit faster, but the maximum capacity of the greenhouses are not changed. Therefore, the staffing requirements are not changed. Um, site screening continues to be proposed, uh, concentrated on that north property line uh, to break up the uh, fence line that's exposed. The other sides of the site are pretty heavily wooded um, by areas that are in protected wetland areas, and therefore that screening is um, cannot legally be uh, removed, uh, even if we wanted to, which there's, there's no intention of doing. Um, in terms of lighting and security, uh, again, the, the lighting to be added is strictly indoor, uh, sorry, inside, interior lighting, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, within the greenhouses. Um, uh, those are proposed to have blackout curtains, which uh, on top of making us better neighbors are also a requirement for growing the plants. It's actually necessary during the flowering phase to ensure 12 hours of total blackout darkness. Um, so the, the blackout curtains um, do effectively keep the light inside, um, but their actually primary purpose is to keep uh, the light, especially in the summertime, outside. And uh, here I will also note that um, this was brought up at one of our meetings with the planning board. Um, I guess there had been a complaint about uh, bright lights being seen uh, late at night from one of those support structures along the northern edge of the site. Uh, and I think this was mentioned in the narrative, but DMCTC looked into that. Uh, it turned out simply those blackout curtains, which I described, uh, were at the time on a manual switch and an employee forgot to flip the switch before they left and the lights were on at night and the curtains were open. So the, the light was spilling out. Um, and so since then, uh, 
DMCTCs uh, proceeded to um, uh, start adding uh, timers to those blackout curtains, which is also the proposal on the big greenhouses uh, going forward. So those all be on timers. So that's a that's a non-issue going forward. Um, and our understanding um, in some of the neighbors that that spoke uh, at the planning board is that those curtains have been pretty effective at uh, at keeping the light from their experience um, out or keeping keeping the light in where it's supposed to be. Um, on the noise and odor front, uh, we qualified this as a negligible change. Um, the addition of the lights in the indoor cultivation license will allow for more grow cycles over the course of the year. Um, however, uh, the, uh, the noise, which uh, the primary source of is sort of the basic uh, mechanical and ventilation equipment, really just fans and um, carbon scrubbers. Um, are still designed for the greenhouses to be at full capacity as they always have, and that full capacity is unchanged. So um, while, while these impacts could occur um, for more of the year, they would not be any more intense than they are now. Um, and again, those, uh, those carbon filters are incorporated into the greenhouses already um, in order to scrub uh, the odor before the air is ventilated outside. So um, overall, a uh, really minimal change there. So energy efficiency is the one place uh, where we do have a more significant change versus the original approval. Um, and primarily because uh, what the bylaw says is that we were required to submit an energy efficiency plan um, and then also notes that um, cultivation and building greenhouses to generate a minimum of 50% of projected energy use where feasible. Um, and so what we've um, provided here in the narrative, uh, I think is, is sort of our um, best effort to address uh, how efficiently the site is going to operate uh, without getting into too many of the nitty gritty details of exactly what equipment is spec and that sort of thing. And so we approached this trying to look at some kind of objective standard to judge it. Um, and so if we look at the, the CCC regulations for indoor grow operations, um, they have a standard for what is known as horticultural lighting power density, which is sort of in the numerator of that figure is how much uh, power is used when all the lights are on. And the denominator for that factor is the total area of what's known as canopy, which is the literal area that the plants are growing in. So not the total square footage of the site, but really just the, the grow tables, if that's how you're growing, or the sort of area consumed by the plant um, in an in-ground grow. And so if we um, calculate that out based on the proposed lighting patterns um, and the size of the grow, uh, what we come up with, and this was calculated out by, by a mechanical engineer, which is a requirement of the, um, of the CCC, uh, the lighting power density, the total power used for lighting in the proposed facility uh, is about 23 watts per square foot of plants as compared to the standard, which the state says uh, we must be below 36 watts per square. So 23 is compared to 36. And then we actually uh, continued on and looked at the mechanical power density, uh, which is basically the same uh, calculation, but applied to all of the mechanical equipment and everything. And so that, uh, even though the state requires reporting of that number, they don't actually have a standard for it. But the end result was that we use about 10 watts per square foot of mechanical power uh, divided by that grow area. And it just so happens that uh, if you add those numbers together, I'm sorry, I said 23, I meant 25. Uh, the 25 and the 10.7 works out to be just about 36, which is just a coincidence. Uh, but point being that the state sets a power, sets a standard for how much light we're allowed to use. And in fact, the total power being used by these uh, grow facilities is equal to that limit for lighting. So in terms of energy efficiency, we feel like, you know, by some objective measure, that's a pretty good indication that this is a relatively um, efficient site and that, that we're not uh, wastefully using power. Um, and I just asked a question, Chris. Um, our yes. bylaw does say that um, 
cultivators and buildings and greenhouses to generate a minimum of 50% of their projected energy use on site where feasible. You're quite yes. right about the where feasible. Is there any thought at all to solar to help? The, yes, um, so this was not in the narrative, but we had a, a long discussion about it at the planning board and uh, short, short version of the story is we were sent back to do a little more homework on that question. Um, and I've been doing that, so I, I don't. I did not have anything to submit. Uh, we are going to uh, submit in writing to the planning board, hopefully before their next meeting. But, but um, what I, but we do have some information on that, and I, I want to get into that a little bit uh, just to sort of step you through this. And the 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 key item here that we want to make clear is sort of fundamentally why a cultivator goes with a greenhouse grow to begin with, which I think gets at uh, something really important on this question as applied to this project. Um, and that is, you know, quite simply, when you grow in a greenhouse, um, there is a certain amount of energy input into a pound of, of final product. Um, and, you know, in a total indoor situation, all of that energy input comes from basically electricity powering the lights to grow the plants. Mm -hmm. And then the cultivator, when they choose to do a greenhouse grow, is doing that because then uh, a portion of that energy input is coming directly from sunlight. Uh, and so you could imagine a greenhouse could put solar panels on the roof of the greenhouse, convert that into electricity and use that to run grow lights. That would be an incredibly inefficient way to do things um, because the power of the direct sun uh, is actually you know, significantly more efficient at growing uh, the plants as opposed to uh, solar electricity powering the lights. And so then the question is, how much of that needed energy input that the plants need is coming from that direct sunlight. And we looked at that in a couple of different ways. I'm gonna pull up uh, a separate document that I have open here, um, but it just so happens that the answer is a little bit less than half. Okay. And so I'll just, I don't need to quite just take my word for it. We, we looked at this in sort of two different ways. The first one is site specific. And so what you see here is DMCT, I'll say a simplified version of DMC's uh, planned lighting schedule. And the way you read this chart is that uh, running down the left side is tw the 24 hours of the day and running along the bottom is each month from January to December. And the way this is set up is basically each plant's life cycle goes through about a three month phase. The first month is spent in a vegetative phase where they need light about 18 hours a day. And two months are spent in a flowering phase where they need 12 hours of light a day. And so the gray areas here are the total darkness areas when the blackout curtains are put up and all the lights are turned off and they're in total darkness. There's no no uh, energy required at all at that point. Um, the yellow bars represent an hour when the lights are on. And so you can see in those winter months, it's 100% artificial lighting. Mm -hmm. The white bars are times when the sun is strong enough that artificial lighting is not required. And so you can see in, in the middle of the chart, which represents July, uh, that is almost the entirety of the day. Um, in this uh, conceptualization that July month is a vegetative month, again, this is a little simplified, but if we made this more complex so that we had uh, re represented the portions of the greenhouse that are in vegetative versus flower, there's very little difference compared to this uh, simplified version. Um, but in, in that July, uh, you know, all of the flower grow and most of the vegetative grow is pure sunlight with just a little bit of supplemental uh, lighting at the very beginning and end of the day. And so um, what this shows is that about 46% of the time when light is needed, it's being sourced entirely by direct sunlight. And the other 54% of the time, it's being uh, sourced with electrical lighting. Um, and so if you wanted to convert that into sort of energy used over the course of the year, 
What we can look at is that we've got, I gotta find the, the numbers because I was just double checking some things on this, um, that we have a total of about 4,700 hours over the course of the year when light is needed and about 2,100 of those hours that light is provided purely by sunlight. So if we turn that into um, um, energy use, uh, again, essentially 46% of the, the, the light energy input to the plants is offset by the sun. Um, and then additionally, we have an existing 10 kilowatt uh, solar array um, which kicks in another 1%, uh, which, which is, you know, small, but it's, it's not nothing. Um, and then DMCTC is also still in, in the assessment phase as to whether the farmhouse can support uh, solar without structural modifications. If it can, it looks like we can fit about another 10 kilowatts on the roof of that building, uh, you know, so throw in another 1%. Um, and then, you know, looking at the site, uh, and I'll just switch to the site plan for a second, is there really isn't much other opportunity on this site uh, because of regulatory reasons primarily, uh, as well as space reasons. And actually, I'll flip back to this plan. So um, first of all, rooftop solar is allowed by right uh, anywhere, but ground-mounted solar is limit. Uh, there's, there's a limit in zoning of a 10 kilowatt array that's allowed by right as an accessory use, and anything bigger than that is not allowed in AR1. And the limit of AR1 and AR2 is right along the fence line of these greenhouses. And essentially all of the land in AR2 is either in a property line setback, being used for marijuana cultivation, or is wetland or 25 foot buffer, which you know, in our experience with, with Conservation Commission is a do not disturb area on these flat sites. Um, so th there's essentially nowhere else that we can put um, a ground mounted solar. Um, and so then the last thing I do just want to say is, and it's not just take our word for it, that, that it's about half um, in terms of that energy use. We also um, got uh, a report from a group called New Frontier Data um, that did an extensive study, study of the cannabis industry in 2018. Um, they solicited energy data from cultivators uh, in all 31 states where uh, some form of cannabis growing was legal um, and uh, compiled them and split them into indoor grows versus greenhouses versus outdoor. And this chart here, and I'll note that these two bars are on a different scale than this one. Um, and, and what this shows is that the average indoor grow and, and that's a good reference point here because in the indoor grow, 100% of the energy input has to come artificially because there's no sunlight in the building. Uh, the average uh, use was, for, for a year, was about 260 kilowatt hours per square foot of, of canopy. And then in the greenhouse, and I'll also note that th this is total energy, not just lighting. Um, in the greenhouse situation, the average greenhouse grow uh, was consuming about 130 kilowatt hours per square foot, which just happens to be a little bit less than half. Um, and so you can think about the difference there is because we're utilizing the sunlight and there are some complicated interactions in terms of heating and cooling in that indoor situation. There's a ton of cooling that's required because of the heat from the lamps. In the greenhouse, conversely, there's no cooling load because it's all ventilated. There is a heating load, which is also partially offset by the contribution of sunlight and off heat from the lamps, as well as some variable insulation factors with that big blanket that's put on with the blackout curtains. But end of the day is that this sort of independent data looking at the industry as a whole sort of backs up that that greenhouse grow is using about half the energy by making use of that natural resource that's already on the sun uh, on the site uh, in the form of direct sunlight. And then you know the, the last piece of it is the outdoor grow uses pennies on the dollar. Um, of energy, because in that case, 100% of that energy that the plant needs is essentially coming from direct sunlight. So that, that I, I didn't 
intend to go on and on and on <laughs> that long, but um, but I think again, sort of looking at holistically energy required to grow the plant in the form of direct sun falling on the site, I think in terms of the spirit of the bylaw um, that, that we feel like we're right in line with it. And again, we, we do have a little bit of solar um, to the extent that it's feasible on this site from a regulatory standpoint. Thank you. Um, okay, and so then um, I remember which window I was in here. Um, I think it was this one, which has changed. There we go. Um, okay, so that was energy, and there, there's several more points, but these are all going to go pretty quickly. Um, water efficiency. Uh, so the again, the intention of this change is to get a few more turnovers of, of grow cycles. So over the course of the year, uh, there'll be a marginal increase in the amount of water used on the site, but the peak use of water on a facility like this is in the middle of the summer when already under our out, when, when under the outdoor uh, concept, we were at full capacity to begin with. So that peak water use in a single day will remain unchanged. Um, and overall on this site, the vast majority of water is going to the open air outdoor fields. Um, so, so we would say that, that a small to negligible change in the amount of water used and the site is already using a, a finely tuned fertigation system with water monitors to really, and drip irrigation to just use the bare minimum of water that's necessary for the plants. Um, and then, you know, also we do have um, incorporated into the plan some rainwater catchment uh, for some of that runoff from the greenhouses to try to make um, at least a little bit of use of that rainwater to offset our water needs. Um, in terms of hazardous materials, no change. Uh, there are strict requirements as to what can be used on this site. It is, it is essentially an organic farm, even though we can't get certified that way. Um, and uh, the product is tested at essentially a pharmaceutical level to make sure that, that there are no toxic or nasty uh, materials in it. Um, and so the growers are very careful about uh, what materials are on site. Um, um, we, we do have a question. Um, I see from, that. Yes, okay. Um, so the question is about uh, town water being used for irrigation. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the site is connected to town water for domestic water use in the farmhouse or uh, for drinking water, but all of the irrigation water comes from um, an on-site private well. Um, so signs, uh, no change. There is a sign. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, uh, no change of the sign. There is a, a sign um, at the entry of the site uh, identifying the address. Uh, it doesn't necessarily it doesn't uh, uh, make any identification as to what is going on on the site uh, in terms of the product being grown. Um, and then uh, there are certain you know certain security required signs about no authorized entrance um, that sort of thing. Um, again, no change from the approved plans. Uh, greenhouses, uh, this is the definition of a greenhouse in the zoning bylaw. Uh, the physical characteristics of the greenhouses remain the same as what was approved before, uh, including the fact that we have gravel flooring and not concrete, which is part of that definition. Um, no change to buildings on the site. We're reusing the um, existing farmhouse, again, for administrative purposes and a couple of those outbuildings for storage, things like that, no change. Uh, marketing. No change here. There really is no marketing of the site. These cultivation facilities are a business to business transaction. And the vast majority, uh, essentially all uh, of the product here is actually going right next door to Three River Road where it's being processed um, into different products. Uh, hours of operation, no change. Typical agricultural hours. There's some people there early in the morning, late at night, but not overnight. Um, the staffing is pretty low. Uh, the typical, you know, the sort of full-time year-round staff is around 10. That gets staffed up a lot during harvest time when there's a lot of material to come in from the fields. Um, but those are typically um, agricultural workers that are coming in in large groups. So it's actually not that many vehicles compared to how many people there are. Uh, retailer limits is not applicable. Um, there was some basic information that we needed to provide. This is no change from last time, but we did include it in the application um, for complete uh, for reference uh, as to the landowner and um, folks like that. 
Um, inspections and monitoring, I believe, was a new uh, new bylaw that was added in 2021. Um, so we've noted the fact that, that the town reserves the right to do certain inspections and monitoring to make sure that the site's in compliance with all the bylaws. Um, certainly no problem with that. Um, and I believe, you know, members of the planning board have certainly been to the site. The police department has has been to the site regularly to check in with the security team. So no, no concerns there. Um, site plan review is pending. We've got an application to the planning board. We've opened the public hearing. Um, we're hopeful with some of this energy information that I shared you tonight that we'll get a close on that um, in a little over a week and a half, uh, the first Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Um, the reporting requirements, I actually don't remember what this requirement is, but I've got that in front of me. Um, uh, marijuana establishments shall provide public safety officials, building inspector, town administrators, and names and phone numbers, management staff. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that that has happened. And as staffing changes, um, certainly those will be updated. And again, the public safety uh, officials have, have been in regular contact with DMC. Um, uh, there are requirements if the licensee changes, um, and those are noted, um, and if there's a change in ownership of the property, that um, triggers some zoning compliance. Again, that's noted. Uh, there is a desire by DMC to own this land eventually, and we'll deal with that um, issue uh, if it comes up uh, at that time. And then finally, the host community agreement, which we did attach. Uh, this is actually no change from the previous. Uh, the host community agreement was not specific as to whether the marijuana cultivation would be indoor or outdoor. Um, so uh, as far as DMC is concerned, the original host community agreement uh, is still in place and still valid um, for this uh, change in or this for this additional use. And I think that is every box checked if, unless I've missed one. Chris, could you please just give me the date on the plan that you showed us tonight, just so I can jot that yes. down? Yes, let me check that. Um, so the plan as shown, uh, I have to find the right page, of this year, which was a reissue of the last version approved by the planning board. But September 27th, for your purposes, 2022 is the date of the plan. September 27th of 2022. Thanks. <coughs> And did you say this operation is entirely in AR2? Yes. Um, and I'll be just very much more specific when I say that, because I've mentioned it a couple of times, but without actually showing the plan. Um, um, so yes, the, the AR1, AR2 dividing line runs right along this fence line. Um, and so, oops, hang on. And it blew. Um, and so all of the handling of marijuana product from growth to shipping and being trucked off the site occurs within that secured perimeter, which is entirely within AR2. And now the indoor grow lights, are they in place already? Uh, they are not. There is a small amount of lighting in the nursery, which um, again, when we deferred to that CCC definition of outdoor, outdoor is the growing of cannabis without the use of artificial lighting, but there is an exception for propagation of the mother plants. So there is horticultural lighting in the nursery um, otherwise, the only lighting in the greenhouse is, is just uh, safety work lighting for, 
for workers walking around in low light. What was that event when the curtain was let up? So that was related to the nursery. So the nursery has that propagation lighting um, okay. and also has blackout curtains. Okay. Got it. Are there any members of the public who wish to be heard, either a pro or a con? Any board members with other questions or comments? I only had the two questions. One was water and one was power, and they were answered in the presentation. Chris, just so I understand, the, you just said when Roger asked about lighting that there's no horticultural lighting yet in the area where the plants are grown on, just in the propagation area where you start them? Correct. Yeah, what we refer to as the nursery. Um, uh, and so the, the, the way these plants start their life is they're all cloned from a mother plant. And so that process needs to happen under a uh, low intensity lighting. Uh, and that's the one exception under the state's definition of indoor versus outdoor where lighting is allowed. Um, but in the main grow areas where the plants spend most of their lives, there's currently no horticultural lighting at all. Thanks. So we should, uh, the board should decide who the third voting member is gonna be tonight since Bob is absent. Kristen, Fred, Anyone want to uh, step up and be the voting member? Sure, I'll be the voting member. Okay. Well, in that case, <clears throat> unless there's any other comments, we can, uh, or I will make the motion to close the public participation and comment section of the meeting. Second. All right, so then we'll deliberate in... Uh, open Zoom public territory, uh, but we won't ask for any feedback at this point. Seems like it's a well thought out plan. It's an extension of what's already in place and I don't see any harm. There's no neighbors who are complaining and I'm in favor of it. I also am in favor. Yeah, I'm also in favor of it too. It seems like a good plan, well thought out. And I guess they're actually activity going on in the site now that I think is uh, very positive. I don't hear any real negative comments other than maybe what Chris said, that one or two neighbors. But other than that, I think it's a it's a very good plan, a good uh, project in, in total. All right. Well, it has to be unanimous, and it is unanimous. So that's a three to zero vote in favor, and so the application is allowed. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, so in order to write this up, um, first of all, Deborah, do you want I want to collaborate on the writing? Of it? Sure, okay. absolutely. Um, you have the material. The um, I do. I mean, I read it. I, my computer has issues saving things, so I, I don't think I've saved everything. But no, but, I have the I have the narrative, and yeah. um, and uh, and I'm we can write it from that. Mary, do you have the publication dates and the application date? Uh, if I can get it quickly, if, uh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, no. Hold on there. I'll be right back. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, just another minute.
Okay, November 3rd and November 10th. In the recorder. In the recorder. Thank you. And the application date? I think I have that. Yeah, that's probably on the stamped um, application. I'm just, I'm just checking. Application date was October 11. Oh, great. Okay. I'm just getting out of this. I think we have what we need. Yep. Why don't I take a, um, a pass at it, Roger, with the document, and then I can email it to you, or, um, yeah, I can email it to you, and you can look it over and add whatever you need. Excuse me, but was when when you were discussing who was in favor, was that just a discussion, or a, do we need a more a more formal vote with somebody making a motion? I think that constituted a vote. We okay, all pretty definitive. Yep. But thanks for asking. Okay, I think that concludes our business. I see other people who are attending. If other people have any um, desire to speak to the board on other topics, we can, um, we can do that. First. Um, I will sign off. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Hey, Chris. I'll start video. Hello. Um, Hi. Um, Hi, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Lisa and Mike. <laughs> um, one or two, one or two things that um, I have a question about regarding what we have, what we're currently dealing with um, in the property up behind us, uh, which I know everybody is somewhat up to speed on as far as the fact that there are some concerns. Um, one of the things that I do not have access to or I haven't gotten is the original permit that was taken out by Pioneer Explosives back in the early 80s uh, to see what it was on that that the property was going to be used for because I know right now that the owners of the property are, um, are working on the site to make it to turn it into in addition to a site for storing explosives and potentially leasing it out to another part of it out to another company is they are using it to put in all their commercial uh, construction equipment, all the loaders, uh, trucks, equipment, supplies and everything else. And they have continued to um, move forward with making uh, more parking lot areas essentially for storing all of this stuff, which was never um, in the original site plan um, with anything that it has been used for. So I don't know if that is something that we have any um, way of going back to that and finding out whether or not we can uh, get a hold of a cease and desist as far as any more progress until this has been figured out. That was one question. Um, Lisa, have you heard anything at all from the building inspector? Is he responding what? to the emails that you're sending? <laughs> Not well. Um, this morning, uh, uh, Brian, the town administrator, he did send us an email stating that he was working with uh, the um, the building inspector, John Hannum, and, and I guess the town attorney, and they were looking at developing a way to to best approach this. Jim is not being overly responsive, it doesn't seem at this point, and we're trying to figure out what to do to give him uh, the nudge that he needs. Um, and the only other question I had in regard to this is I know with there are enough people that surround that property. Um, if anybody, I, I don't know what the situation is, whether or not that permit, because it has been, um, it has been uh, put, I'm sorry, because it is, because it is there and it's, and it's working at this point, whether or not anybody who abuts that property, if they decided to uh, do some building that follows everything else that the town of Waitley has going on, but what happens if it puts them closer to 
you know, the setbacks that these magazines and everything else require. This is one of the things that I'm trying to get a hold of the ATF about, quite frankly. I've I've gone to them and I have not gotten the answers yet because I haven't had a, a conversation with the woman that I was told that I need to talk with. She hasn't returned my call yet, but I only called her at the end of the day yesterday. I'm hoping to hear from her by the end of the day tomorrow. All right, well, there's, a, I think, a few things to unpack there. The first thing that I want to say is, uh, personally, I might be conflicted in terms of voting on any of these matters because of my representation of your family in the past. But as the chair of the board, I just want to be ultra uh, careful and reminding other board members we have to be entirely neutral in this case. <clears throat> the zoning board may very well hear um, an appeal of some sort. If someone's unhappy with what the building inspector does or doesn't do, uh, it may hear a special permit uh, application via an amendment or a new special permit from the landowner there. We are analogous to a court in that regard. You wouldn't be approaching a judge prior to the case being even filed uh, and, and either lobbying intentionally or unintentionally with information. And so, you know, when people come before the board and it's not a scheduled matter that's on an agenda, we can answer um, procedural questions about how things can be done in, in terms of getting them in front of the board. We can answer record questions like you started with. And so maybe that's a good place to start. <clears throat> the question was, do we have a copy of the 1980 or 1983 permit? And so that would fall under the ambit of Mary, the recording secretary. Mary, do you have any permits or records of old permits going back to the 1980s? Uh, not at hand. <laughs> uh, I, I, I haven't been down it. I haven't been to the town offices since before COVID came in. I'm sure there are old, old records there, but I don't know whether any of them apply to this i would have to check have somebody there check or go down and check myself so that would have to be uh something okay. I, I can i can make a phone call down there and ask and see whether or not they can pull that up because that was actually what we needed to do for the uh special permit when it was turned over to the current owners so well, we i don't, got that I, I don't know if it's i'm, I'm just saying i i don't think it's a matter of pulling it up anywhere i think it's a matter of going through the drawers for paper copies from 1980 or whatever oh no <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, we do we do have a copy of the 2013 permit which i emailed to you but yep. you're, you're quite right i i mean the 80s none of us were were on the board yeah <laughs> and i and i know right now that they are working on the premise that this kind of falls in line with the way it was set up initially and they're not doing anything really different but without seeing that original that that's taking their word for it and that's anybody looked at the registry of deeds records okay registry of deeds records will do because the law has always been that a special permit granted by any board is only active once it's recorded at the registry of deeds registry of deeds records go back to the early 1800s or even earlier in some okay. cases okay um, I have one other question about the the amount of noise coming um, from the trucks and uh, is there any bylaws that can be uh, I guess enacted or, you know or steps taken to stop that in the present? All violations of any sort that relate to noise, dust, um, visual things that, that come from the zoning bylaws, any violations start with the building inspector. Okay. Has to act or not act. And, and then the aggrieved abutter has rights based on what the building inspector does or doesn't, but the zoning board never goes out and cites somebody for yeah. Yeah. 
violation. It's, it's well, I, I was, yeah, I was more looking for are there rules against we'd have to look that, them up. that type of thing with the noise, like, I mean, you know, calling the cops or something. I mean, is that a viable? It's 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 is a legitimate question, but it's part legal question, it's part zoning question, and then it, it sort of tips the scale of this might be the topic of a future matter, a very soon future matter that we're going to be asked to hear. So it would really be you potentially might harm your own case if the other yeah. side can allege that the zoning board is prejudiced against them because we've given okay. you I understand okay yeah i was just curious about the what actual what you should do is just peruse the bylaws they're online and you probably have the book and, and, and yeah I, call, I, out, call out portions that seem relevant to your case okay thank you Yeah, and I, I just want to say that um, Marcy Nickerson, we're in a butter, my husband, Joe, and I. So we have concerns uh, about change of use, possibly, with, uh, um, I'm just doing my own investigation to see what's what's going on, because a lot seems to be happening there. Well, you guys might want to pool resources and, and proceed that way. Yeah. Well, you're a good good place to start, right? <laughs> so, well, I certainly hope it gets resolved and doesn't have to actually come to a formal uh, hearing in front of our board. But if it does, we'll be ready. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Excuse me, Mike and Lisa. I I don't have your your last name in front of me, just for the record. Also, it's, it's Moore M O O R E. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, we should talk about the minutes. Hey, Mary, thanks for getting together the minutes from September and October. I did have a chance to read them and they look thorough and they look accurate. Okay, let me just grab it. I, I read the September ones. I wasn't at the um, the October one. September looked good to me. Just grab them each here. Okay, we're... So Roger, you said they both looked good. Yeah, who else was at the October one? In October, we had, I have everybody but Kristen. Do I, did I? I, I wasn't there, Kristen. October 6th was the one where you weren't there. R right, and Kristen was the host. Oh, well, there's an amendment to the minutes. Oh, see, I didn't even look at that one because I knew I wasn't there. <laughs> are you sure, are you sure, Deborah? that you're not talking about the earlier one we had in November. Two weeks yeah, ago. I, was, I hosted no, the November one. Oh, I don't believe my I, goodness, I hosted you October. are absolutely right, Roger. I Time was, yes, you're quite right. You're quite right. Um, yes. Well, Fred, you must have been into the other one. The yes, other one. yes I, I have no problem with the minutes. Uh, okay. I would recommend approving the ones as, as written. For oh, both the, the two dates. I think that's good enough. Two, two, two members. So you can mark them approved, Mary. Okay. So we haven't approved the ones for what? November, what, 5th, 3rd? November 3rd? Right. November, she, November she 3rd has not been written yet. Not been generated yet. That's the only ones that are lacking approval? Yeah. Okay. That's pretty good. Yes. Alrighty, so as it stands now, 
December first meeting in this, oh, excuse me, the first Thursday in December. There's nothing on for that. That would be December first, right, Mary? Uh, just. Well, I mean, it is December. Yeah, if December December first is the first Thursday. Yeah, it is. So, but there's nothing scheduled at the moment, from what I. Uh, no, I got nothing else in. No new stuff. So, yeah. right now we would have. Uh, well, we don't have DT CMC coming back. We just settled them. So right now it's totally empty. And it's probably just about too close to file anything and be heard by then. Yeah, this is the middle of the month. It would have to be published. This is the 17th. Are, are there even two Thursdays left? <laughs> I, let me just look. I don't think there are. Next Thursday is Thanksgiving. Right. Uh, no, there are not. And after that, it's December. December. The next Thursday is December 1st. Right. Yeah. Well, then, no, we, we don't have another. Then this may conclude our business for the year. Oh, that's <laughs> right. right. Okay. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I don't see anybody. Have a good one. Yes. Certainly have a good Thanksgiving. Yes, everybody have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Absolutely. All right, yes. let me just stop the Thank recording. You.